Praise the Lord. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. We are so thankful to be here tonight. We're so thankful that you are here with us, that we get to uh, enjoy the word of God and uh, just learn more of him. As we do tonight, as we begin, does anyone have a prayer request or a praise report this evening? In Jesus name. Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Who else tonight? Edith. Praise God. Jesus' name, amen, amen. Who else tonight as we begin? In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone else? We begin. Yep. Praise God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> In Jesus' name, just carry that four ten with you. <laughs> Anyone else this evening? Anyone else as we begin? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Would you stand as we as we begin? We're so thankful. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for everything that you have done. God, all that you are doing, God, how you've uh, how you're transforming us for the glory and the honor of your name. Father, today we lift up Anita, Father, to you, God. You see, Father, what she is facing tonight, God, and, and in the days coming. We just pray, Holy Spirit, for healing. We pray for healing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ for the glory and the honor of your name, Father. Father, we lift up uh, even uh, our this, this sister-in-law, Father, tonight, Javi's sister-in-law, God, that you would just minister to her. We believe that, Father, what you have begun in her, Father, you will complete it for the glory and the honor of your name also. We just ask that your strength, Father, would be made perfect in her, Father, even through this time. Whatever it is, God, that she's feeling, Father, whatever sickness it may be, 
God, we put her into your hands. We trust you and we know, Father, that you are faithful and that you are able tonight, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, God, we, we lift up Eli's mother-in-law's mom, Father. We just pray, Father, for healing, God, in her body as she has fallen, Lord. And, and we just pray, Father, for, for healing in her bones, God, that you, Father, would help her through this time. That, that Lord, that you would complete the healing and that, Lord, that she would, she would feel your strength, your peace, um, your power, Father, at work in her life, God. We thank you, Father, for Sister Janie's brother, Father. We just ask that, God, that your spirit would just continue to be with him and his wife and lead them and guide them as they reconcile this. God, we pray that, Holy Spirit, you would be the one that would do the reconciling. You would be the one that, that would help them and strengthen them, God, tonight, Father. We just... We just give you all the glory. We lift each and every person, Father, up in, into your presence, God. We lift this service into your presence. We ask, Father, that once again, Father, your anointing would be upon your servant, Father, would be upon your word tonight, that, God, that your word would go forth and it would not return unto you void, but it would, it would fulfill the promise, God, uh, and, the, and the word that, God, that you sent, it would fulfill, be fulfilled, God, and that, Lord, that you would receive the glory and the honor as a result. Help us, God, not to just be hearers, but truly, Father, especially as we listen tonight, God, help us to be doers of your word. That, Father, that we can go out and do the work, Father, that you've called us to do. Because, God, we know, Father, that, that there, is, there are great rewards, but our greatest reward is, is knowing you. And knowing that we are honoring you, Father, in the things that we do. Pray, Father, for each and every person that will be ministering today, God, and those that will be ministered to. We ask, Father, that you would be glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. You may be seated. We are, we are a blessed people. Um, for those of us that are here, for those of us that hear the word, um, wherever they are, and, and this, is, this is why it's so important for us. We take the word of God seriously because the word of God is true. And, and God, he's, he's given us His Word so that we can live by, so that we can walk by, so that we can truly um, know the reason for which we've been called. Hebrews chapter 12, um, we're going to begin there. We, we kind of ended there last week. We were kind of going through it a little bit. Um, I know that there's still a, a little bit to go, uh, even tonight, to cover what we, we have to cover. But I, I want to... I want us to, to take, uh, again, the responsibility that we have been given um, seriously. God has called us as the body of Christ. Um, and, and he is, as Paul said, and as we've already studied, he's, he called, Paul says, we are ambassadors of Christ. Meaning that, that we don't have an opinion in the matter. We just, we just do what we're told. I mean, I mean, when we think about it, that's 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 many times that's the way it is in the home, isn't it? Um, just do as you're told. Now, we don't like to hear that. I mean, as a, as a child, but we knew that as we grew older, that it was very beneficial that we obeyed our parents because we realized if, if we come from a, 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 a decent home that our parents cared and that's the reason that they were saying what they were saying and so as as ambassadors we are to do what we are told we are not to, to try to change the way that God does things or think that we can come up with some better solution we are just to obey the word and do what we're told and I think if we do what we're told that's the safest place that we can be as believers is to obey the word of God. So Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 1, I, there, there, there is a lot to, to point out, but I, I, I'm going to do my best to just kind of go through it. Um, he says, since therefore we are, uh, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And we talked about that in a little bit more detail last week. Um, the, that sin that so easily entangles. He says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for, 
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, remember we talked about you have to have something to look forward to or else it's going to be difficult to endure. We have to keep Christ always before us. We have to always come before Him with thanksgiving. We have to come before Him with worship. We have to be, be, be in, in that spirit of praise and, and glorifying and lifting Him up. And we always have to keep Him in, in this place and in the position that He is. Because the moment he begins to come down from that position, we're the ones that begin to rise up. Because instead of looking up to him, we start looking down at him. And that's a dangerous place to be because when, when we begin to, to think more highly of ourselves, when we get our eyes off of Christ and we don't set the joy before us, then we don't want to do what he asks us to do because we think we know better and our feelings and our emotions and, and those things come first. And we have to be very careful as we, as we consider this. So he says in verse 3, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So, so consider Christ who was sinless, who, who endured opposition from sinners so that you don't grow weary and lose heart. And, and this is what he says. What are you going to lose heart in? What is the battle? What is the struggle? What is, what is it that you, he's, he's speaking of? He says, in your struggle against sin. He says, he says, in your struggle against sin, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding your own blood. In other words, guess what? For anybody who, 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 who has struggled in sin or with sin, um, that's a normal thing. If you're struggling with pride, if you're struggling with some, something in your life, what Paul is, is saying to us is don't quit. Christ didn't quit on you. Don't quit on him. The accuser of the brethren is going to come and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to blow it at times and... And, and you're going to trip up and you're going to lose your temper and you're going, to, you're going to have these moments and Satan and everything else is going to try to come in and cause you to quit and say, well, it's, it's not even worth it. You can't do it. So, so, but remember, set him before you. And so he says, in your struggle against sin, you haven't, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You haven't died yet. In other words, the battle's not over yet. You may have been struck down, but you're not destroyed. Pressed down, not forsaken. I mean, I mean, God is still with you. He's still there for you. It doesn't matter if you still have breath. Keep serving the Lord. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? Now see this, the, the, again, the word of encouragement. It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one He loves. In other words, if you are under God's discipline, understand it is because He loves you. And, and I'm reading this because there's so much, and I think sometimes we do a just, uh, an injustice by just merely part and parcel certain things. So he says, if God is, if you are under the discipline of God, then understand the importance of the discipline. The discipline only reveals that he loves you as his own child. You're his son. You're his daughter. Why wouldn't he discipline you? You know, when I, when, when, all of us can attest. We've seen other kids and we've seen other people doing things. And, and again, we would say, not my kid. We, saw, we witnessed that even this past year when, when we saw all the stuff that's happening out in the streets and they're out there vandalizing and doing all that stuff. And, and, and we're thinking, not my kid. And if they want to live in this house, they're, they're not going to be acting like that. And, and, and when we see that kind of thing, this is what God is saying. We can't discipline those people. That's what the law and that's what the authorities are for. And, and they're set apart and called by God to, to protect those of us that are just normal citizens. 
They're there, and, and that's what the Bible says. They're called to do that. But me, as the father of my home, I'm called to keep my house in order. So if you're under the Lord's discipline, understand this. He loves you, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Now, again, we say son because, it, because I, I, I know that some people, especially in the time that we, get, that we live in, the political correctness, what he's speaking of is his son that lives in you. And it's not that he's correcting his son. He's correcting you because you and I need to allow the son, Jesus Christ, to live in us and be glorified through us. So he says, endure hardship as, uh, in, endure hardship as discipline. Endure hardship as discipline, for God is treating you as his children, for what children are not disciplined by their father. And then uh, verse 9, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who discipline us, and we respected them for it. Not, not at the moment, right? We didn't like it. He says, how much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. And then he says something very powerful. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Nobody likes discipline. Nobody likes to be disciplined. And I tell you this, parents don't even like to discipline. We have to discipline we don't like to do it. We don't, we, don't, we don't get enjoyment out of it. The joy comes in the fruit that comes later. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Understand that discipline is training for us. That discipline that you receive in Thing I might need some batteries. <laughs> so God calls us and he has called us as his children. Quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Praise God. And so God calls us and, and, and here's the thing. He disciplines us because he's teaching us. Why do you discipline your child? You're teaching, you're teaching them a lesson. By not disciplining them, what you're doing is you're teaching them a lesson. You're saying that, that, that without restraint, you just do what you want to do and don't worry about it, consequences, whatever, you know, we'll deal with it when it gets here. Well, that's no way to discipline. So when God begins to discipline us, what he is doing is he's training us for the things that he has called us into. Verse 14, he says, make every effort. It doesn't mean that it's always going to be possible, but the, now we're speaking about disciples. We're speaking about Christians. We're speaking about those of us. We're going to see the reason why God says, speaks these things to us, the reason why the calling is deeper, the reason why the responsibility is greater, he says, it, make every effort. That just tells you right off the bat that it's not always going to be possible, but you do everything that you can to make peace and to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. So now it's not going to, it's not always going to work out. You're not always, you're not going to please 100% of the people 100% of the time. And if you haven't figured that out, um, let this be your wake-up call. He says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, now we, 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 we spoke on that a little bit last night. And the reason being is because um, I remember even as a young, young man, this, this was a verse that came up a lot. Without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. And, and that is not something you hear much about in the church today. And, and I say the church because we don't expect it from the world. 
But we don't hear about it a lot in the church. To live holy, to live in a way that is honoring, pleasing to God. To live and, and to give your very best, to do your very best. What, what, what amazes me when I come to this point, when we begin to speak about the church, can I tell you this? We have, and, and not me, but not, not, not I, I don't want to say, but Christians in general have a lower standard in the church and for things they do for Christ than things in the world. And, and that's, a, that's a hard truth, but it's a truth. You say, well, what do you mean, pastor? What do you mean? What do you mean? Okay, well, let me, let me, let's, let's talk about this. We have a high standard when it comes to things of, of work. When, we, when it comes to things of school, your kid, your, your kid joins the football team, whatever, joins whatever team. The coach says, I need them here by this time. Guess what? You're, you're there by that time. When they say, you know what? We need a uniform and this is how much your uniforms are going to cost. And you're going to pay for it. Guess, guess what the parents do? Oh, if, we want to be, if he wants to be in football, if he wants to be in this sport, if he wants to do this, she wants to do that, then, then we got to... And, 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 and anything that the standards, the standards, the standards, your boss says, I'm there, I'm there. All of a sudden, when it comes to the church, well, we don't have the money. We don't, you know, uh, uh, I, I, and we start making excuses. Well, you know, the reason why we didn't go and, and we weren't there or the reason why we didn't do this and the reason why I don't serve or the reason why, because, you know, I'm already too busy. I'm already got, I already got a lot of things because God's house and God's standards don't matter as much as the worldly things that you have put value on. You see, you, it's in the end, which one's going to matter more? Which one's going to matter the most in the end of, of all things? I, I don't have to tell you, you know, this, you know the answer. And, and that's the way we live. He says in verse 15, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. That no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defiles many. In other words, in other words we don't do this to offend people. We do this because this is, this is just the way things are. I, I, I need to live my life in a way that I can, I, I can be the example that others are to follow so that they don't fall short of the grace of God. And because if I don't, it will cause many others to stumble. If you don't, there are many people that are looking up to you and th th there are many people that are, that, are, that are following you as you follow Christ. Because you said you were a Christian. You said that you were a Christ follower. And that's a, that's, a, that's a great weight for you to carry as a believer. When people become bitter, all of a sudden, everything inside of them begins to change. Bitterness begins to, 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 to eat at you. And, 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 and it makes you uh, envious. And, and all of these other things that come along with it. To destroy your walk with God. Well if that's what it is to be a Christian. Forget it. There's a lot of people that are watching us. He says see to it that no one is sexually immoral. Or is godless like Esau. Who for a single meal. Sold his inheritance. Rights as the oldest son. Now this, this, this scripture, this, this verse right here is very powerful because he says, who for a single meal sold his entire inheritance. And then he says afterwards, you know, that when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected even though he sought the blessing with tears. He could not change what he had done. You see, it, now let me bring it into maybe a, a, a little bit more of an understanding into your mind, my mind. 
Paul is speaking about your struggle with sin, your struggle against the things of God, your, that, that spirit, the flesh that is at war within you. And so what he's saying is, is don't let a moment of sin ruin the rest of your life. Because isn't that, isn't that what happens? Because it's very, it's, it's very needful for us to know this because the mind is a very powerful thing. And once the mind begins down a certain path, it begins to imagine things. It begins to build worlds. It begins to, to, to think things. And it, and it says, well, you know, if I had this, it would be so great. And, and how many of us, in, the, in, in an honest way, if I, if I had more money, it would, I, I would do this. And if I, in my life would be so much better. And, and, and think about it, even when you were younger. If I, if I could just get married, everything would be great, right? Well, how's that working out? Right? Because, because you got married... But 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 it didn't take away all the problems. Well, if, if, if we just had a house, if I just had my own house, then then my life would be perfect. Well, you got your house. Is your life perfect? You see, we, we begin to build these things. And this is what sin does. Sin says, if I could just have this, I know it's not right. I know it's not good. I know if I could just have this. And but for a moment, ask Adam one thing, one time. And look at all of us here tonight. We're living in a broken world. And so what Paul is saying is it's very important that we keep ourselves from the things of this world. It's a struggle against sin. It's a struggle against the things that the world, the, the world that is trying to pull you in. He says, who for a single meal sold his entire inheritance. Be careful. Because Satan doesn't like to tell you the price tag on sin. Satan doesn't like to tell you that if you do this, this is, this is how much it's going to cost. It's going to cost you your home. It's going to cost you your family. It's going to cost you everything. Everything. Um, I, 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 it just reminds me of a, a, of a gentleman that I had seen many years ago. Being a pastor here, he came up. And the first time he came, he was real clean cut, had his had glasses, his glasses on and he was in fine clothes and everything, just, you know, just struggling with some things. And, and I knew something wasn't right. And and he'd come up and he says, I, I just just fell into a hard time, just need a little bit of money for gas, whatever. And, and you know, looked fine gentleman. Um, he came back about six months later. Um, he didn't look as fine. Ran Same story, ran into a little bit of trouble. About six months after that, I was driving down the road and I saw him walking and completely dirty, torn clothes, no glasses, hair disheveled, you name it. And it was it, it was instant. The Holy Spirit began to speak to me because of one one action, one time. Here's a gentleman who I don't know who he was, but. Probably had his own business, probably was well to do, had everything going for him, had a wonderful home, wonderful family, wonderful wife, kids, everything. Made one mistake. See, Satan doesn't tell you and I the price tag, but God does. And God warns us. And this is why it's this is why it's so needful. Beware of the little foxes, because the little foxes spoil the vine. See, the, the, the big foxes, they just take the grapes. The little foxes are the ones that come in and they, they, they tear the root and they pull the vine and break it off from the, from the root. Beware of the little things that you allow to slip into your life. Be, be, beware of the little things that you accept today because the little things are going to lead to the big thing. Beware of the things that you do, you do, the places you go, what you watch, the things you see, all of the garbage that tries to, to, to make its way into your life because what you are doing is you are feeding yourself something that is not real, that is not reality. And Satan, as we've often said, always oversells and always underdelivers. Be careful of the way that you live your lives. Be careful who for, for one, one single meal sold his entire inheritance. 
You don't think one sin can take you to hell? I can tell you it can. Because usually that one sin has been led on by another and another and another and another. And then he says, because we read that last week of, uh, in verse 22, that we have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all the spirits, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, he said all of this to say what he's going to say next. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. In other words, you didn't come to some earthly thing. You are not representing an earthly kingdom. You and I have been called into the king of king, his courts. We have been called into his kingdom to represent him. So he says, see to it that you refuse not him who speaks. He says, if they did not escape. Now, now I, I, I'm going to stress it. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them from earth, how much less will we? You see, they didn't know Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ hadn't come. They didn't have the full revelation of who God was. They didn't have the full revelation of what God was up to. But we do. We know Jesus Christ. We know what God is up to because we, he's given us his word. He says, if they didn't escape, how much less you and I who have the full revelation, revelation of who Jesus Christ is, how much less will we escape? If we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. You see, this is the, this is the thing about the gospel that, that too many Christians take so lightly. They don't believe that it's... Mentally, they believe that it's the word of God. But they don't believe that it's the word of God. Because believing takes action. Believing is obeying. The Bible says, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. And so, so he says in verse 28, to close this thing out, he says, since, there, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful so that we, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. We are called to a greater calling than anything this earth has to offer us. And the thing is, is how are we treating the calling that God has placed upon our lives? Do we just live mediocre in, in a mediocre way? Just barely getting by? Just doing enough to, to, that in our own minds we are pleasing ourselves? Instead of moving forward, sharing the gospel with others, doing what we've been told to do. See, we give what we have to give. We should be willing to go wherever God calls us to go. Do whatever it takes so that, so that God will be glorified. We have to be willing, as Paul said, I have become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. Because Paul even knew that he wasn't going to save everybody because not even Jesus was able to save everybody. Have not I chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil. So Paul says, I've become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. That some may come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Brother Clendon talks about ministering in, in, in Russia. And living with the, with the people of Russia. He says, you never realize how poor they are and what they suffer until you're there. He says, I've been in the homes of people that have had no place to shower, no water in the house. Then the food they put on the table, you know, was ten times better than they eat. They're trying to do their best for you. And when you see that, you have a true love for those people. In the North Pole, he says, it was the worst part of Russia I had ever been. 
I stayed in the home of the Yakutans. I've never in my life been so sick. My interpreter, Olga, just dismissed everybody else and said, I'll do the cooking for him. So as I lived in that house, I laid in that bed and watched 10,000 cockroaches going across the roof. You would think that the hard winter would do away with some bugs. There were four things that thrived up there. I was in there just a little break of what they call summer. They don't have seasons. They have summer and they have winter. The average temperature is minus 50. While I was there, it was right in August and the flies were terrible. They, what they, all they had were Chinese strips of fly paper. I had four of them hanging in my room. In 10 minutes, they were so covered you couldn't tell there was anything but flies. That's all it was. Gnats everywhere, mosquitoes, flies, roaches. I said to myself, I must be crazy to be here. He says, no, they never heard this gospel. They never heard that Christ died for them. What's a few roaches? The same rag they used to wash the dishes with, I watched them scrub the floor with, then just throw it back into the dishpan. I had to sit down at the table and eat dinner. Whatever is set before you, you don't ask any questions. Only the love of God can make you do that. That isn't the way I live, but that's the way you have to live sometimes. There is nothing else that can drive a man or a woman to be that for God. You see, we don't understand how easy we really have it. See, the devil, is a, he is a, he's, a, he's a great deceiver at telling you and convincing you how bad you really have it. If you only had this, if you only had the, that, I can tell you this, let the love of Christ constrain us and we'll do anything. We'll go anywhere. We'll be anything that God wants us to be. I've become all things to all men that by all means... We might save some. What method do these saints employ in making Christ known? These are the methods that you and I are going to have to use. The New Testament, it presents two methods for reaching the world with the gospel. And here are the two methods. The first is public proclamation. Preaching the gospel. Standing up and proclaiming the gospel. Declaring the gospel to those that will hear. The second is by private discipling. By one-on-one sitting down with somebody and sharing sharing with them the gospel. These are the two methods that the gospel presents for us as the church. Now as the church, it is what God has given us to do. As the church, we're commanded to make everybody on this earth To know what we know. We are commanded that everyone that we, everyone on the earth needs to know what we know. We can't make them accept it. That's not our business. But we must present it to them. We must declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must declare what Christ has done for us. The first one was used by by Christ himself and and his disciples. Wherever people were gathered, there was an opportunity to present the good news. They preached. They spoke the good news. They proclaimed the gospel whenever it was, wherever it was, um, they did it. They preached it. They They were unashamed of it. I think sometimes the thing is, is we're ashamed because we have too much to lose, we think. We're afraid we're going to lose our reputation. We're going to lose out in a friendship. We're going to lose the the, the thought that, that they're going to think differently of me. Who cares what they think of us? It is what God knows about us that matters. It's not about what man thinks about us. It is what God knows. 
So we find gospel meetings in the synagogues, in the marketplaces, in the prisons, on the beach, in the riverbanks. Wherever they were, they proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They preached to every creature. They saw people together, they stood up and preached. They proclaimed the gospel and they were always ready in whatever moment, at whatever season to speak the gospel. Under every circumstance, they wanted Christ to be made known and that was it. They wanted people to know what they knew. They wanted them to know the Lord Jesus Christ. In their character, there was an urgency To proclaim the message. There was an urgency to tell somebody what Christ had done. So it made it it, it made it unthinkable to limit themselves to just conventional meeting places. In other words, just to be in church. Was church an important part of their lives? Absolutely. They went to the temple at the time that it was time to go to the temple. That's where Peter and John were on their way, when you think of it, when they saw the man at the gate beautiful. The Bible says they were on their way to the temple to pray because it was the hour of prayer. They were doing what we would consider the mundane thing. They were just obeying what they were told. And all of a sudden, an opportunity arises and God impresses upon them to pray for this young man, to pray for this man and, and to, to raise him up. And the power of God was, was seen, the gospel was preached, and God was glorified. They knew that they had to tell everyone what they knew. It wasn't, it wasn't a compromise. There was no need to look for a map or to plan plan some special place to meet. They were going where he wanted them to go. Wherever they were, they, they preached the gospel. They weren't merely looking for opportunities. They were taking every opportunity they could find. They went everywhere, the Bible said, preaching Christ. And this is the method. I've, I, I, you'll, you'll find there's a lot of people that will try to tell you and, 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 and they'll teach you this is how you need to do it and this is what you need to do and this is what you need to do. Can I tell you this? Preach Christ. Preach Christ crucified, raised again. Just preach Christ. It's not, it's not enticing words of men's wisdom, but it's demonstration of the spirit and power. Preach Christ. Lift him up. The Bible says, if I be lifted up, then I'll draw men unto myself. You see, you don't just have to learn how to reach a certain people group. You don't have to learn how to preach, reach, you know, Muslims or Buddhists or this. Um, You preach Christ. It's a simple truth. Preach Christ to them. The Bible says that they went about preaching Christ. And guess what? Prepare yourself and get ready because because even as he said, consider these things, the, the things that you are facing, the hardships that you will face as discipling or discipline from the Lord. God is disciplining you in, in ministering the truth. So when you begin to speak Christ, because because you can talk about God or a God or some other God, but the moment you bring up the name of Jesus Christ, you will face opposition. Because Christ represents holiness. Christ brings, all of a sudden, brings conviction upon people because people know what Christ stands for. And that's why... That's why you're going to face persecution. They were martyred. They were locked up. They were thrown in prison. And guess what? If they did it to Christ, they'll do it to us. Just get ready. You don't have to learn how to reach the Irish or just just preach Christ. It's the key to everything. Preach Jesus Christ. The Bible says they went everywhere preaching Christ. What do I talk about? Talk about Jesus Christ. 
Talk about how he loves you so much that, it, that he gave himself for you. That God loved you, that he gave his one and only son. That Christ loved you so much that he gave his life. That, that, that Christ loved you so much that when he, when he rose from the dead and he ascended to the Father, that he sent the Holy Spirit to come so that he could be the, the earnest of your inheritance. And he is the one that has sealed you to the day of promise. It's Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ. And Christ is all that we need to preach. The second method was private discipling of indivi individuals. And this is this method Christ also used when he began to train the twelve. He called the little band of men and that they, they would be with him. That he might send them forth. And this is the method for reaching the world. What do you think that we do here? Here at Life Ministries, our, our desire is the same thing. Why do you think we come to church on Wednesday nights? Why do you think we come to church on Sundays? Why do you think we come to church and, and, uh, on a Tuesday and begin to pray for, 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 for those? Why do you think we do what we do? Because the whole time what we're doing is we're discipling one another. We're encouraging one another. Why do you think we have small groups? Why do you think that we, we, we encourage you to get into a small group and we want more small groups so that we can talk about Christ? And so that we can lift Christ up, so that we can be strengthened in, in, in our faith, so that we can know Jesus Christ and so that we can grow together. It's our method. The method has never changed. We have to train them to send them. Not just all over the world, but send them back into their workplaces. Send them back into their homes. Send them back to, where, to wherever they come out of from the week. Send them back into those places so that they can minister Christ. Because the reason that you are wherever you are is to preach Christ to a lost and a dying world. That's, that's what it's about. It's to talk about Christ. If China is going to be reached, then guess what? It's going to be the Chinese people that are going to have to reach them. But somebody has to train the Chinese people. If Russia is going to be reached, it's the same thing. The Russians have to reach Russians. That's why Jesus said, go first in, to Jerusalem. Why? Because he was speaking to his servants. They were Jews. Go, go, go into Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and all the, the uttermost parts of the world. Discipling those people to win their, their nation, their country, their people. For Christ we have to train them and then send them as Christ has given us the command and it's the same thing for us why do you think we're so mission oriented not just not just in 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 Edinburgh because we are mission oriented in the sense that wherever you are that's your mission field that's where God has sent you but we're mission oriented in the sense that we support missions and those that God has called to go. The effect of the method is recorded in history that they turned the world upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ. They went forth with a message to proclaim, to preach, to tell. And they had been sent by God. Understand that when you get ready to go out and minister, when you begin to witness to somebody, you are sent by God. You are God's representative. I know we talked about that. You are God's representative. You may be the only gospel they ever hear, the only gospel they ever get to see. The only, the, as the Bible says, your life is an epistle read of every person. Meaning you may be the only gospel they get to read. When they look at your life and they see the way that you conduct your life and how you live your life before them. It's going to cause them to, to desire what you have. And when they come to you, you better tell them and preach Christ. It's Christ. It wasn't your good looks. It wasn't your good works. It wasn't your gifts. It wasn't your talents. It was Christ. In Christ alone. The Apostle Paul used this method. And he urges Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, chapter 2 and verse 2. He says this. And these things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Meaning I didn't tell you in secret. 
He says, the same commit thou unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. In other words, the same things that you heard me teach in front of many people. He says, the same thing I want you to do and commit to those who are able to teach others. What you see me do, that's what Paul is saying, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ. What you see me do, you can do. And the awesome thing is you can probably do it better. You just have to trust God. You have to go out there and you have to have faith that God is going to meet you where you are and that He is going to use you. It was just the private discipling, getting a person saved, sending them forth to save another. Many times there was no structure that that, that was possible but getting into the streets and preaching the gospel. There was no other way, there was no other possibility but, but, but that the church one by one would go out there and reach. You tell, what you, have, you tell what you have been told. Pass the message on. Make sure that the person that you're telling is born again. Allow the life of God to, to come in him and then let him go and speak the same thing to other people. When the man at Gadara came to Jesus and was delivered of, the, of, of a, over a thousand demons, he wanted to follow Jesus. And, and Jesus said, no, just go tell them what God has done for you. You see, he, 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 what message was he going to speak? He was going to share his testimony. I was a, I was, I was a maniac. I was chained. I was bound Satan had me all tied up. But there was this man, Jesus, who showed up on the shore one day. And when I came to him, he set me free. You talk about a powerful message. All he had to do was preach Christ. He didn't have to know it all, but he had to tell what he did know. And see, and that's the, that, that's a, if you ask me, that's a deception of the enemy and that's an excuse of the Christian. I don't know enough. Oh, you, you, know, you know more than you, you think you know. Share what God has done for you. Pass the message on. Allow others the opportunity that you've been given. The first step is be, be careful and prayerful. When you begin to, to witness to other people. So that they will know the authenticity of the gospel. Allow the anointing to, to be there. Allow, ask God for His presence. Because I can tell you this. A life is hanging in the balance. God's anointing will be there. He will make sure that the message gets across loud and clear. Jesus says in Matthew 28 and 19, Go forth. And make disciples of all nations. So as the disciples were to go forth in the name of Christ. And they followed these basic principles. Which were outlined in the word of God. Now, now here's the thing. There again are some things that we have to. We have to be willing to allow God. To discipline or bring those disciplines into our lives. We have to be set on what we know to be the truth. We don't change, we don't change the gospel. We speak what we know is true. Again, we don't have an opinion on this. We just speak the truth. In other words, we have to be under subjection to the Father. We're under His authority. Such a powerful thing, though. See, nobody likes to think of, uh, I have to be subject to someone else, right? We, I mean, human nature doesn't like to be think that it has to be under somebody's authority. But the beautiful thing is, is if I'm under his authority, then I can have authority. 
See, I don't have any authority if I'm not under authority. And you, you, you'll never have authority until you come under the authority of God. So they were wise as serpents, harmless as doves. They expected and prayed to God for wisdom because they knew that the path that was set before them was dif- difficult. They knew that they, they had to do it God's way. They weren't about to change His methods. They were meek and lonely in heart, and lowly in heart in their, conf- in their contact with their fellow men. Others did not need to, to fear physical violence from them. But they did fear their prayers. I believe that we need to be a praying people. A people who know our God. And a people that our God knows. Because the Bible says on that day many will come and he'll say, I never knew you. So get to know God. How do we get to know him? Through the word of God. And prayer. We have to keep our hearts pure. In John 18 and 36, the Bible says, Jesus said, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. Understand the world systems and the way the world operates isn't always going to, always going to, to go in the fashion or the way that you think of it. But you're, you're, the, the kingdom you serve is not of this world. Don't be discouraged by what happens around us. We do our part when it comes to politics, when, we come to, when it comes to vote, because we desire and we pray for our leaders, as the Bible tells us, and we live godly lives and we do our part. But when it all comes down to it, it doesn't matter what happens in the end. This is not our home. We represent another kingdom. We are ambassadors of a heavenly country. We're just passing through as pilgrims and strangers. And let us not forget that. We have to be honest in our dealings. And I'm just going to lay just a few things out as we close this out. We have to avoid deceit and deception of every kind. Live your life in a way that no one can point the finger at you and have a reason to do it. The Bible says, blessed are you when they lie and speak evil about you and speak evil of you. And it's not true. If it is, repent. Our yes has to be yes and our no has to be no. We refuse to adopt the popular lie that the ends justify the means. Doesn't work that way. Under no circumstances do we do evil That good may come of it. Each one of us is an embodied conscience that should rather die than sin. That's a strong statement. This is the people that God will use to reach the church. True disciples anchor their work to the local church. Now... I can tell you there's, there's a lot of people who don't like to do that. They go into the harvest field of the world to win souls, but they lead those souls into the fellowship of a local church. True disciples realize the local church is God's unit on earth for propagating the faith. Disciples are wise to avoid entangling in alliances of every kind. They steadfastly refuse to allow their movements to be dictated by human organization they are rather led by the spirit of God and finally these disciples avoid publicity they always want to sink into the background as they lift Christ up they don't seek any glory for themselves they don't reveal their strategy to the enemy They know that heaven will be the safest place that will reveal the results of their labor.
we don't look for a crown or a kingdom here. We wait for the, for the words of our Savior when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what it is to be a disciple. That's what it is to be a Christian, a Christ follower. I pray that at least those of us that are in this place and maybe those that are listening, we would, we would never take for granted the high calling that has been placed upon us when we declared that we are Christ followers. Understand the great responsibility that has been laid and placed upon us. And let us fight the good fight at whatever cost that the king may receive his glory. It's not easy. And there's a lot that we may suffer in this life. Um, but it will be worth it all. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your instruction. We are the church. Your church, the body of Christ. God, I pray that you would help us to walk in line and to live and conduct ourselves and our lives in a way that is honoring and pleasing to you. May we not turn to the left or to the right, but may we look unto you, the author and perfecter and the finisher of our faith. Even you, for the joy that was set before you, endured death, even death on the cross. The shame, the scorning. May we be willing, Father, to endure whatever it takes, Father, to glorify your name, to lift you up. I pray, God, that we would never bring you down to a place of disrespect and dishonor and that we would never provoke you to wrath, to anger. We would never grieve the Holy Spirit and we would not fall short of your grace. But, God, we would live with purpose and give you, Father, all of ourselves without reservation. Help us. Because God we cannot do this on our own. But God we look to you and we thank you. We praise you tonight for all that you've done. And we just ask that God that you would help instill this word in our hearts. But I pray that it would permeate Father through our, through our spirit. And that it would be evident Father in the life that we live. May you receive all the glory Jesus. We ask it all in your name. Amen and amen. Praise God. I just wanted to, to make an announcement before uh, I, I, I had told my wife, she says, don't forget. And I said, if I don't forget, I won't forget. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? No. <laughs> um, we're, we're moving our, our Christmas party to Friday night because Saturday um, it's just going to rain. They, they, it, we've been looking at it for the last couple of weeks. It's just going to rain all day on Saturday. So Friday night, we're going to be moving our Christmas party, the church Christmas party. It'll be there at our house. Uh, many of you have been there before. Um, if you need anything, I know Nelda's out there. I, they might be preparing something. But, uh, but thank you for being here. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there. And God bless you in Jesus' name.